Hello and welcome back to Logical Magic Examining Esoterica. Hey guys, it's a solo episode today and we're talking about how to find your power and how to find your focus and why it's such an important part of spiritual alignment to be able to spend time alone as well. So before we get started, um, let's go over the housekeeping because you're more likely to listen to it at the top of this according to all stats. Um, you can find me at authorizingmoon.com to book me for a tarot card reading or life coaching session where we look into the issues that may be holding you back from success and your subconscious and underlying issues as well. And the only way you can book me is through authorizingmoon.com. And then I have a Patreon with weekly readings and monthly readings. They're spirit guide messages frequently about emotional healing and the energy that you will be facing, the challenges that may be coming up and how to prepare for them. And then you can find the video versions of these podcasts at at the rising moon.com uh, and also at Chromecast at the rising moon on YouTube. So they're always up there and I hope you're able to check them out. Let's get going with the topic today. So one of the things that we're always trying to do in a spiritual journey, and they're always harder than we want them to be, we will be asked to spend time simply being able to be with ourselves in our inner world. And for some people, that really does mean being single, simply because we have to release attachments in order to be able to step into our full alignment with our divine self, to live in our most purposeful energy, and to get the most reliable information about what to do next. Now, everybody does have the ability to receive intuitive messages. Not many people find it. And it is partially a construct of the modern world. Um, one of the ways that you can start honing your focus if you do not like meditation, because one of the things I hear from clients over and over again is meditation is not for me. The reason you think meditation is not for you is that you have lived in a world that bombards you with uh, basically stimulation at all turns. Um, it didn't actually used to be that way. It was the advent of the smartphone and social media that really began to have people feel like they always need to be connected, always being to be needed to be connected. And remember, a connection and an attachment are essentially synonymous terms. <laughs> So they've got you attached to something exterior to yourself at every turn, and you rely on it to supply a lot of your internal world. And that is why one of the easiest ways, if you do not like meditation, but we're going to go into meditation in a little bit as well. If you don't like meditation, one of the ways to start honing your focus is to, when you get home at the end of the day, after you're done with work, or if you're always at home because you work from home or you're working for yourself, you need to take four, three to four hours a day in which you put your phone into do not disturb or on airplane mode and put it in another room. If that feels dreadful to you, that is an indication that you have an attachment to heal because you should be able to disconnect at will from the demands of the world. So it's one of the exercises that you can perform to see how many attachments am I dealing with, how difficult it is for me to not have contact with the outside world. If you start to feel anxious, if you start to be afraid that something will be going wrong, you have something to heal. If you cannot put your phone into another room and not have contact, what I keep seeing is people out grocery shopping and they can't even go for a full errand without feeling like they have to be in touch. That is actually a false sense of urgency that has been engendered in our society. And it is one of the things that pulls people's focus away from their own intuitive guidance, which will then lead them towards the answers that were right for them. And not everybody comes here to have the same experience. I'm saying that all over and over and over again, because we are taught to want very particular things in this world, but what your soul came here to learn may not be the same thing as what your society tells you to want. What your society is always, in the modern day world, going to tell you to want things that you buy so that you feed into an economy so that you increase other people's riches all the time. And that is also what it's another form of attachment. If you are serving something other than yourself in your the bulk of your energy, then that's an attachment. And in Buddhism, now I'm not a Buddhist, but I do actually, I practice something called celestial and angelic magic that has its roots in something called theosophy. Now it is a different version than the one that was in the late 1800s, but it has the same principles where you um, interact with the deities um, of major religions, Hindu, uh, Buddhism, uh, Christianity, and um, for some people it's going to encompass Egyptology. It does not for me, but it is a kind of cafeteria approach. It does have, it rely on the idea that what you are drawn to are the different lives that you've experienced in the past. 
that this has a foundation of your energy in it. And if you don't believe in past lives, that's absolutely okay. But one of the things about diversification of energy is it does actually release attachments. When we get locked into patterns, then our answers have difficulty um, finding us. And that is why the easiest way, if you do not like meditation, to try and start getting more information is to clear your mental space by detaching from electronic devices for three to four hours a day. Some people find that almost excruciating. And the worst that it, the worst that it is, the more that you have a form of addiction to heal. Now, don't react to addiction with that shaming, blaming, oh my God, I'm gonna be found in a gutter type of um, energy that our society tends to judge the idea of a compulsive behavior, which is really what an addiction is. And if you really cannot be separated from your phone for big parts of time, for big chunks of time during the day, you have a compulsive problem. And compulsivity is one of the easiest things to start addressing when you're trying to find your focus. And why do you want to try and find your focus? It allows you to manifest. It allows you to receive intuitive guidance. It allows you to grow and to expand, which is one of the things that fights aging, which is another thing that our society tells us to be terrified of and is really just not that bad. If you really continue to grow and expand, then your, your mind doesn't slow down. Your ability to believe in greater things, in purpose, in the idea that we are here to do something continues to expand within you. Don't fall for the false narratives that are really um, kind of in, uh, superimposed on your belief of self. You're programmed to believe these things. You're programmed to believe that your value begins to diminish as you age. Your value is within your own hands. And this, the way society treats you should not impact how you treat yourself. You should have respect for your emotional needs. You should have respect for your emotional process. And you should have respect for the idea that my mind is my own. My energy is my own. My thoughts are my own. My magic is my own. My energy is belongs to me first. And that is what that exercise is with just putting your phone aside. Now, again, people freak out. And I really, I'm asking you to examine what might be at the root of that. If you really cannot disconnect, then it really is a form of attachment and an attachment that doesn't serve you. Please remember every social media platform that you interact with has an algorithm, which is a literal computer program that tries to give you information that will keep you locked in, keep you focused on that, keep your energy going towards that. You can't stop looking, you can't stop looking. Now it's nice as a diversion and we do need healthy escapism, but if you find yourself, call it's called doom scrolling on places like Twitter or TikTok, then that is also another indication that you need to take a break. I'm just recently off of a break um, from social media that was about three months long. I just put it away one day. I, I just had a feeling this is not really serving me and I wanted to focus more on developing a meditative practice. And so I just didn't open any social media apps for close to three months. And when I went back, they didn't hold the same appeal. I got bored very easily. They are not as engaging when you're not following an energetic pattern, again, that is programmed into you by an algorithm, which is giving your power away to an exterior force. And you need it for yourself to find your guidance, to find your path, to find the love that you want, the life that you want, and the success that you want, you need your own energy. Quit giving it to other structures to make them money. Because that's what the algorithm also does. It's trying to draw you in so that the platform has more traffic so that they make more money. That is the easiest way to examine uh, whether or not, if you want to figure out whether or not you have attachments, do that exercise. Do it as soon as you can and do it during your waking hours um, and, you know, try not to then focus on a computer game. Try not to, it's called transference, transference of an attachment. Try to sit with yourself, read, learn something new. Currently I'm studying, <laughs> I'm, I'm not a very interesting person by a lot of people's uh, uh, measure because I like history great, a great deal. I'm studying um, the Bronze Age and leading into the Iron Age, what led to the Bronze Age collapse. And I, re I read about that every night. I sometimes watch documentaries, but I also follow up with reading because we learn more in a written format. It helps us uh, basically imprint the energy or the information into our brains. And then I quiz myself the next morning. Because that is one of the, I want an expanding energy. I want an expansion of my mental capabilities and expansion of my energy. And I want an expansion of my own ability to manifest, which is what everybody wants as well. And so I am expanding my knowledge base. 
And that is another easy, easy exercise. So when you put something aside, fill it with something productive. You can also exercise, you can cook, you can, anything that is educational will fill that void in a way that is very helpful indeed. But you don't want exterior forces to program your beliefs and you don't want exterior forces to program your thought patterns. If you wake up in the middle of the night and you start feeling anxious, understand that that is also a form of dysfunction that you are trying to heal. Dysfunction and the attachment, almost the exact same thing. And dysfunction is what breeds disorder. Now, a lot of people who are trauma survivors do have multiple forms of disorder, or they have what I have, which is um, a high level of dysfunction that can be addressed through meaningful and productive routine and patterning. And that's what I worked with in order to, um, I have multiple things that if I'm not careful with them, slide into disorder, but I'm very aware of what they are doing in my life and how to counteract them. Now, what, no matter what you are suffering from in any form of your emotional world or your mental world, we have a remedy in the modern world. And some of it is, sometimes it is uh, appropriate to take medications. I don't personally take medications. I have nothing against them. I'm very grateful for modern science that can help people with their brain chemistry because it can, in fact, be genetic. It's not a sign of weakness. Actually, some of the greatest minds in the world struggled with their own ability to have focus within this reality. We have different uh, physicists who uh, manifested different forms of schizophrenia at different points as well. The, the brighter you are, the more your brain is likely to be able to encompass. And that is one of the reasons that you want to feed it something that is productive, to keep your imagination in something that will keep you growing within this earthly realm, but not shut off your spiritual realm. So the first thing to do, again, divorce yourself from your phone for a little bit every day. That is the very, that's the easiest, the least taxing way to start honing your ability to have your own psychic messages, to have your own intuition, and to be able to trust your guidance. If you're always taking input into that brain space, into the place where you need to be receptive for clarity, then you don't get your own messages because there's essentially no room within your your brain your neurons your synopsis your things that are it's always taken up by what is being fed to it rather than asking what is supposed to be there in stillness and in peace and that's going to bring me to the topic of meditation which can always be a little bit of a hotbed one and you need to understand i have an anxiety disorder i do not take medication for it i do manage it through exercise through diet through awareness making sure i have healthy habits gives me healthy results and meditation was not easy for me. I would have told you as little as four years ago that me I was not a person who could ed meditate because my brain would race. I have a very busy brain. And um, I finally developed a method and I call it training wheel meditation. It's outlined in the how to meditate with anxiety and depression podcast. But it's basically counting your breaths in and out and allowing yourself to sit with your eyes open if it's really super uncomfortable for you to sit with them closed at first. And that's that's how you get it started. And it does not have to last for long. Do it for one session of 10 breaths if you really are struggling with it. And why do you wanna do it? It has nothing to do with achieving nirvana or a blissful state, or you know, other people will think that you're chill and calm and in flow with the universe. What it is about is about being able to determine through your own willpower, which your willpower is what manifests things in your life, where your focus will go. That is why you want to take it away from all exterior stimuli and put it into your own hands. And the way to do that, again, divorcing yourself from any forms of electronics that are uh, feeding you constant information that masks itself as entertainment, but is in fact just filling up your, your brain space with what they want to put there rather than what is meant to be there. Every single platform has an agenda in trying to make money. And I'm on YouTube, and does it have an agenda? Of course it has an agenda. We, we, I can use it for what is good as well, to try and give people information about what to heal. But I don't do a lot on social media any longer because I had concerns about what it was encouraging people to do with their time, their energy, and their focus, which was to focus very much on this electronic platform 
that does have an algorithm that curates your for you page that does have advertising that tries to program you to buy things. And I love YouTube. I really genuinely do. It is also the place you can go and learn about anything. Half the documentaries I watch are on YouTube and they're very academic. I don't like the history channels. I've stuff. I like academic presentations of ancient history. I find it interesting. Um, it is a genetic thing. My father was actually a historian. So it makes a lot of sense. And I come from a very long line of teachers on my father's side. But I also come from a lot of dysfunction on my father's side, including a lot of addiction with smoking and drinking and a couple of other things that I won't go too far into because it's not all that fascinating to hear about how, you know, oh, my relatives said this, that, and the other. We're all trying to deal with what we have in the here and the now. Sooner or later, we have to let go of the idea that we can blame absolutely everything on generational patterns and understand, well, once you are aware of them, what then becomes possible is the awareness of breaking them. And that is about putting the power within your hands. And that is about determining your focus. And when you determine your focus, what do you get? You get your ability to have your own power within your own hands to determine where your mind, your thoughts, and your energy goes reclaim yourself through some forms of solitude. And for some people, that really does mean needing to be single and not forever. It's just that what we are programmed, again, there's a lot of programming in our society, particularly women are programmed to desire a romantic story in their lives, to really prize that. Our movies, our books, um, our literature all focus on the idea that there is somebody out there who will shower you with love and you will get them and they will get you at a level. And you know what you really need to do when you hear the phrase, you have to love yourself first, is you really have to love yourself in order to be able to put a stop to the people who would only give you a small imitation of that sort of romantic love. Now, does it exist? It does, man. I mean, you don't see it as frequently as people want it to be there. It's again, if we're talking about life as a pie, it's meant to be about 25% of a pie. It's not meant to be the focus of lives in the way that we have a tendency to do so. And I read tarot for a living and a couple of other things, obviously. And um, I do have people who identify as women as clients. And I do have people who identify as men as clients as well. And some of them are straight men. And, and the reason I'm putting this out there is I, there is a pattern here that it really uh, established for me an awareness in a way that nothing else could have. My female clients are very, very, very likely to ask me about love because their stories, our character identification was always with, you know, the girl being chosen, the girl being loved. Now, it has changed a great deal with Gen Z and uh, Gen Alpha, and that is very, very good. There are more stories of, you know, female empowerment where the girl is the focus of her own story. She is the main character. And the point is not finding a dude, but rather finding herself, her own power. And, you know, a dude accompanies her on some of these journeys, but is not the focus of it. And that's very healthy. And my straight male clients have a tendency to ask me about their careers. I, I genuinely, I can count on one hand the number of times uh, a straight man came to me and asked for a love reading. And I've been doing this for a while. So it's not that it's not that they never ever focus on love. It's not that it's completely unimportant to them. It's just that it's not as important as it tends to be to women. And that is a disparity and an imbalance that can only be corrected by learning to the love you are looking for in another person, give it to yourself first. If you want somebody to take you on special trips or send you flowers or do it, do these things for yourself. And if you think they aren't worth as much, remember you're asking an exterior force to convey worth on you rather than finding it within. And the only way to protect yourself from people who might misuse your love, your energy, your focus, and your dedication is to be able to be self-protective in a way that only people who love themselves really can be. Now, did I always do that? No, I remained in a very bad marriage um, when I really shouldn't have. And I was doing it partially for my son, and I am very aware of that. Um, but so much has changed. I've healed so much in the time that I have been single that it amazes me that I ever like continued seeing that person when we were dating because there were so many red flags. Now, did I have a bunch of red flags? Yes, I was extremely unhealed. I had a lot, a lot of like epic amounts of trauma that needed to be healed, but I was very dedicated to trying to heal it, even though it was not an easy journey. And when you heal your trauma, you begin to understand that you truly do deserve love. And if somebody else isn't there to give it to you, 
You know how to give it to yourself so that you never let the long, wrong people linger. And this can include friendships. It can include employment situations, which there's a great big societal pushback against the idea that workers are like, why would I dedicate my life force to somebody else's pursuit of their fifth summer home when I can barely pay my rent and I can barely pay for my groceries and I barely have any savings, if that? There is no logical reason. There is no logical reason. So you should only dedicate and focus the amount of energy to get the tasks done that you should always remember that your priority is your own life, not that, you know, billionaire summer home or the owner's summer home or the CEO's summer home and bonus. We have been programmed to think that it is normal to focus on the betterment of people who are far above us than to focus on our own lives and to have a healthy work-life balance. So this is part of the reason I'm actually a big fan of Gen Z, because they won't take a lot of crap in the name of capitalism. And thank goodness, because it is a really detrimental force within our world. Now, do, is capitalism good to me? Yes, sometimes it's been very good to me. And things are nice. I'm a Taurus. I like things. But I'm also okay without them. I've lost a lot of things over and over. And so I believe in the impermanence of any acquisition. And it has freed me up from a great deal. I enjoy things while they are there. And I let them go when they are not here. And that is actually how we're supposed to view relationships as well. When they are beneficial, when they are healthy, when they are respectful, when they are a positive force within your life, then the focus being on them is delightful but that you are not so blinded by the need for them that you stop spotting the ways in which it's no longer beneficial. And that's what solitude can also do for you. So solitude also takes the place of meditation. And some people in a spiritual journey will keep finding that they are asked to spend uh, what they believe is ridiculous amounts of time alone. And the way to foreshorten that is to remember that it's for your benefit. So that particularly a lot of people are in a lot of emotional pain. They're in that emotional pain because a lot, what was supposed to be a love relationship, and sometimes it's familial, like it's frequently from childhood, was highly damaging. It was something wearing the guise of love, but not behaving in the energy of love, which happens all too frequently. And when you learn how to spend time by yourself and how to treat yourself properly and to care for yourself and never look to an exterior source to validate you, then you, you really, you don't put up with much from other people when it comes to disrespecting you, using you, disregarding your feelings. But then you also have to be able to honor that other person's feelings and expect to give and take but what happens is people give, 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 thinking that that means that the other person will be like, they'll be so grateful, they'll give back. But frequently that other person just take, 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 takes until the person is clinging to an illusion of a relationship that does not actually exist. It's just what they are, because they are afraid to be alone, they have to be in denial. And that is not an accusation. My God, did I ever do it? But spending time alone has freed me from the idea that it... <laughs> It could ever happen again. I, I really, I genuinely, I don't know what the role of a romantic relationship would be in my life, which is not the same thing as saying I would remain single forever. I can if I need to. And I'm not looking for a relationship and I am not dating. And I have no plans of ever dating because I know how to be happy by myself. And I did see somebody in the comment section, because one of the things that I do do on social media is I read articles where um, it's the uh, am I the asshole uh, thread usually on Reddit and pardon the, the swearing. I rarely swear on this podcast, but that's what it happens to be called. But it's curated for places like Board Panda. So it you know kind of picks and chooses the responses to give you a good theme. And I like it because it teaches me a lot how people are viewing boundaries, how people are viewing relationships as well. And one of the things that I had been reading in a comment comment section was somebody saying, I do not understand how you're why you're supposed to be happy by yourself first and love yourself first. Doesn't that mean you would never then want a relationship? If you're happy, what would be the point of a relationship? And I did not respond, but I wanted to say exactly. So you would only ever have relationships that added to your existing happiness rather than establishing your happiness from a point of being unhappy. And if you are unhappy by yourself, you have something to heal. It is not a judgment, it's an injury. If you really think that being single is a punishment, first of all, 
why would you think being alone, which is spending time with you, which is what you are asking somebody else to really value doing, is a punishment? If you expect somebody else who's really super cool to want to hang out with you, then it starts with you. All st Everything starts within and then manifests outwards. As you heal, everything in your life begins help, becomes healthier. Your friendships, usually your uh, relationship to work. And I have had really struggled with that because on my mother's side are Scottish coal miners, people who literally would work themselves to death. Now, my grandfather was actually the manager of the mine, but he... Um, worked his way up to that. He started in what are called the pits when he was 13 years old. He was incredibly, incredibly bright, and it's why he was able to keep moving up and moving up and moving up, because he was just a ferociously intelligent person. And um, But from that, I have this genetic predisposition to work myself to near death because it's trying to escape deprivation and poverty and you know the because he didn't go into the mines when he was 13 as one of the brightest kids in that particular area because it was what he wanted to do it was a necessity and that one of the things that we have to do is learn how to deal with our fear of survival which will always be part of the modern day it just is it's a dangerous world we have to overcome fear we have to find a way to be brave and you need to be brave enough to figure out a way to be okay with your circumstances when you're prioritizing your mental and emotional health so that you can then build something sturdy and lasting from a healthier place. And so sometimes it will involve um, a reduction in uh, material things, which very much happened to me, but it has been very worthwhile. I'm a healthier, a happier person. Um, I know how to recognize my emotions and take care of them in a way that I never did when I was always trying to hide them because I was always around, I was also around narcissists who do not like it when other people have emotions that are inconvenient to them and have a tendency to attack them for it. And so I became a master at masking my own feelings for myself. Being alone has led, like, there's nobody who's going to punish me for being sad or angry except me, and I better not do it because that doesn't heal it. <laughs> And so I try to be very understanding of the emotional needs that and fluctuations that we can all experience. And my ability to be by myself has been the thing that put me in touch with what I really need. And it does it for anybody else as well. So that's another way that you can find your focus and find your power is by stepping into your solitary energy and knowing that it really is better to be by yourself than to be with the wrong person because the wrong person will reinforce and sometimes worsen the existing damage that makes you so frightened at the thought of being alone. Realistically, and this is not to judge anybody's family situation, realistically, you're always by yourself. You are the only, your truest ally. Um, a lot of the times that when we think we have these wonderful family connections and they will ride to the rescue if anything goes wrong, people frequently discover everybody has all their own crap and they are focusing on their own lives and we're often left alone to solve our own problems. And that if we aren't, we again are ceding control of our decisions to an exterior force in the form of like mom, dad, sometimes husband, brother, that sort of thing. That it really is... <sighs> You will learn to love yourself when you respect the idea that it is better for you to be able to struggle through a problem and solve it than to go to somebody else with it because you do. And that sounds like I'm shaming therapy. I'm not. But I'm talking about calamity and trying to hold people up as shields is that one of the things that you want to do is find your faith in yourself, which is another cure for codependency. It's another form of independence, having self-confidence, which is what people who become codependent. And please remember, it's not a character flaw. You're literally programmed to believe that you have to have a partner to be safe, to be whole, to be viewed as valuable. And we've got political candidates trying to say exactly that, that single women with cats are somehow less valuable to society. Did they pay taxes, contribute to the actual economy? They also have the vote. And it's probably not a good idea to denigrate the idea of being a single woman or a single man or a single person because we have individual value, but our society wants to use the structures that has us produce more workers is essentially what it is. And so they prize the family structure and you know try to demean and degrade people who are outside of that as being unimportant when in fact they are the remedy to the idea of capitalism.
The idea that you would be able to be happy by yourself also means that you can be happy without stuff. It also means that you can be happy without the validation and approval of these shaming power structures who try to control people through doctrine sometimes. Please remember, when I always have to say this, when I speak about the divine and I speak about faith, that is separate, separate from religion. Religion is something that tries to harness and use our connection which is internal to faith, to the concept that there is more to this than we feel guided, that we find our signs, that we find our guidance. That exterior religious structure wrote up a bunch of stories around that idea and that concept. And a lot of them were based on what these energies could really do. But then they superimposed it onto faith and tried to make it interchangeable so that they could use the power and direct the people who had faith. And so that's another reason why solitude can help you find your inner voice is because you may not realize it, but your inner voice has been told what to think. Everything you think, everything you feel was about the world, about people around you. You were taught it. We are all students manifesting our lessons when we withdraw into self. And it can be done through meditation too. If you're like, oh, I really don't want to be single. Sweet. Learn how to meditate. <laughs> you have to be able to spend time with yourself to get your personal guidance. And it can be done through a variety of ways. And that does include the severing of electronic ties. Um, I'm sure it can be a little frustrating for my clients, but when I'm not working, I now have my phone on do not disturb because there's no such thing as a tarot emergency. I'm not, I'm not a trauma surgeon. I, I'm not going to be able to save your life after hours by answering your text. And um, that is not to demean. I love my clients and they know how much I care about them and they know how much energy I put into giving them healing resources after our reading to make sure that they can continue on a healing journey, that they can find the best that they can be. But that I had to recognize that it is, it's a lot of energy I put out there. So I have to protect my energy when I'm not working. And that is something that I had to give myself permission to do because in particular, women are taught that we're supposed to be giving and giving and giving and giving and giving and giving and giving, and giving until people have so much emotional dysfunction from that, that the resulting stereotype of a Karen is easily found. What you see in those behaviors are people who are desperate to find control because they feel controlled. What you see in those eruptive behaviors are people who are holding back how angry they feel about how little power and how disregarded they are in their own lives. And so they try and control and demean other people. And is it healthy? Good God, no. Is it forgivable? Well, only in that it is part, again, of an injury. And then it becomes that person's responsibility to recognize and take responsibility for our own behavior. It's a very disruptive and a terrible thing. But one of the things that can free you from a feeling of negativity in the society is to remember the people you disagree with were just taught to believe different things and are manifesting different injuries in their poor behavior. Callousness, negativity, cynicism, these are all the results of people losing belief because belief, which is faith, which is, again, that connection to the divine, has been so misused by something trying to plug into it like an outlet and use it for the end goals of people, usually men, seeking power. So this all started out with how to find your focus. Recognize all of that as it doesn't mean the world is sinister. It is simply that it is trying to get an end result out of your life force. Something in this world, when you're interacting with Twitter, when you're interacting with TikTok, when you're interacting with constant texts and the need to always be available with that false sense of urgency, nothing can wait, and nobody will like me if I'm not in touch with people nonstop. That is not true. Your real friendships will be there, and the surface level ones will drift away, but you don't really need them because they're not there to be emotionally relied on. They're just there to fill a space that you could fill with your own hopes and dreams and guidance and purpose. So it's a difficult world to live in sometimes, but finding your focus and part of the reason that there is so much emphasis on the whole dark night of the soul concept as you come out of it, you are in your own individual energy. You are connected to your divine self. You know what to say, what to do. And it does not mean that everything then comes to you because honest to goodness, once you recognize what the empty construct of stuff really is, because it can't, I've been in a house fire, I've been divorced, I've been, I've like houses have come and gone, things have come and gone. I've gone up and down in material circumstances. And honest to goodness, even though things are nice, 
they aren't the make or break of my personal happiness. I'm actually much happier with a far simpler life. There's a lot less pressure in it to make it look a certain way as well. It's not something that I'm always polishing to have anybody else like approve of my lifestyle, my life, or think that I'm successful. Instead, I feel successful because I am happier and I am healthier. And please listen to that sentence. I feel successful because I am happier and I am healthier because that's what success is. If somebody has convinced you that it is a giant bank account, they have an agenda in that. They have an agenda where you're feeding a power structure, but you will be more successful as a person when you are happier and you are healthier. And you can go back to Steph's, uh, Stephanie's um, um, episode on this, where it was the uh, power of simplicity, I think, but she is the person who gave up a corporate lifestyle after having a big anxiety meltdown, quite frankly, um, according to her TikTok, that she left behind that corporate job and she decided to travel the country in a Jeep. Now, could I do that? No, I am a creature of comfort. I'm basically a house cat. Um, I need a nice place to rest every night. And I don't know what I would do without constant access to a shower and a bathroom. And I'm very much a westernized person. I'm not a rough it kind of gal. I'm not your frontier woman. Um, but she really enjoyed the freedom and the having good experiences. And she found and continues to find that there is a lot more value in her life, that she is happier and she is more successful because she is healthier. But when she was doing what she was told, she got sick from it. She got sick from it. If you cannot focus on what you choose, if you cannot be happy by yourself, if you lose hope frequently, if you spend a lot of time wondering why you don't have what you keep working so hard to do, it is because it may not be the thing that brings you the greatest happiness and health, which is what success is. Rethink what you think of success. You want to be happier. You want to be healthier. If you look for it in stuff, the newness wears off and you need more stuff. And it's really fragile in this world. You can lose it to all kinds of calamity. It's why insurance rates go up and up and up and up and up. If you don't pin your happiness in stuff and you start pinning it in the idea that this is a fascinating world. Every single day can be different. I can have a different experience. And if I try, I can find the things of value in the experience that I'm having because I have control of my focus, which means my mind is my own. My energy is my own. My power is my own. My magic is my own. That's what solitude and finding your focus does, is it removes all of the cords or attachments that are trying to plug into you to get you to plug into it so it can feed off that energy. So you can feed that end goal instead of your own end goal, which almost anyone I've ever met, they want to be happier and they want to be healthier. But we have been programmed to believe that that happiness and that health only lies down one path. And it lies with peace and joy within and the ability to find worth in every single day. Even if you wake up with a headache, even if you wake up in a sad mood, even if you wake up because in the middle of the night I had a bad dream and I woke up and I was so anxious that I had to sit there and talk to myself about it, it was just a dream, let it go, just a dream, let it go. Has that happened to me? Oh my gosh, obviously. <laughs> That's how I know that script so, so, so well. Whatever you're dreaming about, the emotional tone of it is trying to tell you about what you're trying to heal. If you dream about situations in which you're constantly in conflict, you need to find peace, a way to quit fighting a way to make peace, maybe even with the people that you've harmed um, or have been, they've harmed you. And that leads me to the role of forgiveness, which I've talking, I talked about a little bit before in that we have a very misguided understanding of what it is. It is not actively wishing that other person well. Often forgiveness, there's a void of feeling. It's like when you think of that person, there is no responding emotion is because you have let something go. And that's another way of releasing attachments. If you have resentment, it's a form of attachment because you want a different resolution and are having trouble expect, accepting that you're not going to get one because other people have all their own crap and their stuff to do. And if you start again and learn the lessons, you can rebuild any situation into the shape and the form that you want. Not everybody has the same privileges in this world. I'm very aware of that. I'm aware that my traumatic backstory usually results in people who are sex workers, drug addicts, or in jail, and often all three. 
Why did I get a different outcome? Because I'm just a little bit more fortunate in the way that I present to the world and I come in a societally approved form and shape. And I'm very, 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 very aware that the reason that all of that is true is my ancestors, my genetics, the very people who screwed me up are also the people who gave me enough privilege that I had a slightly easier walk through life, even though I had a lot of trauma to resolve. I am so aware that I am not uniquely afflicted. I am so aware that what the things that have happened to me happened to far too many people. So my focus isn't in the why of it all, but the how do we fix this? How do we make sure that even though there has been suffering in this life, here's your first aid kit to make sure that it's healed so that you can be the best version of you in this world. And when you're the best version of you, you're kinder. You have a tendency to be more generous. You have a tendency to forgive more easily. And you have a tendency to manifest more easily as well. It all lies in your focus. Focus usually comes from solitude. And again, meditation because it feels to people like if I don't do it easily, it can't be for me. Oh my goodness, could the opposite, ne it's, it's never more true than in that statement. If you struggle with meditation, you have something to heal that would be benefited from that meditation, from being able to stop your racing brain that is always searching for the next thing to do. Whereas if you clear that space, you know what the next thing to do is. And sometimes it's to take a lot of time to heal, which is what I've had to do in the last few years. And it's been really hard on me. And I started to touch on that with the truly damaging work ethic of my Scottish uh, coal mining granddad, who was, by the way, run down in the street at the age of 60 um, because he was running to go and weed um, the con convent gardens. That This is true, by the way. <laughs> like he, it was a Sunday. And even though he worked six days a week, on, on, like, he would go and he would weed the convent garden. He took. He was a very gifted gardener, and so he took care of the convent, gar the convent's garden for them. And it literally got him killed. That work ethic killed him at the age of sixty, and he was healthy enough to be running at a clip. It's not a good thing. It's not something to admire. Um, my brother, my half brother, who is related to the Scottish side. Um, Versus um, my my father, I, I, we both grew up. My, he grew up with my mom. I grew up with my dad um, until he died when I was fifteen, and um, that is a long and a different story. But it's why I have a half brother, and we have such disparate experiences, and why I talk about it, my entire childhood as if I was entirely isolated because I was. He wasn't there. <laughs> no, nobody else was there most of the time, other than me and like whatever. Uh, dysfunctional caretaker that then was also part of the reason that I had so many markers of privilege to move more easily through life than people with similar circumstances. And again, there are far too many people with similar circumstances. But that work ethic got him killed. And my work ethic, I was uh, that's what it was very admired. It was very admired because my grandfather's work ethic had elevated them from extreme poverty to being, you know, closer to middle class because he literally worked until it literally killed him. And I think that his wife, who lived for 40 years after he did and mourned him every single day of his life, and his daughter, who is my mother, would have much preferred having him around because that was a really, really long period of time to not have him around. And he was a pretty good guy. Now, did he have his own stuff? Of course he did. It's generational trauma. But I remember that none of these people had the tools available to them that I do. And the thing that we need to recall when we're looking at a work ethic is that what you're told to admire, what you're told to prize, again, has that societal agenda behind it. That sounds very damning. Some societal agendas are actually quite good. But if it's solely about making other people money through an incredibly self-punishing work ethic, I need to remember workaholism is still a form of addiction. And we have had certain forms of addiction programmed into us. It's why it's very important to release the idea that your self-worth might be tied up in the idea of, do I have any compulsions? Do I have any addictions? What am I doing compulsively? Try the phone experiment. If it is super freaking hard for you, you have an attachment, you are currently behaving in a habitual or a compulsive energy, and please don't judge it. Just recognize it as this. It's this. This is why I can't be happy because something exterior to me is draining my energy all the time. Whenever you're constantly drained, 
it's very, very difficult to find the balance to be happy and to have good perspective. And that is what solitude does. And that is what a spiritual journey leads you towards, is your ability to take a perspective on what is going on in your life that will be helpful and educational and healing. Find your focus and you will find your power. And that phone experiment that I'm talking about, it's the way to test whether or not you have something called popcorn brain, which is a programmed form of attention deficit disorder. That is what those social media platforms have done to you. They have programmed attention deficit disorder into you for their own ends. If you cannot put your phone aside comfortably for three hours uh, of your own volition, I'm not talking about, I've been on a plane constantly. I couldn't have any, you had other things that you were doing. I am talking about having it be your choice, not imposed upon you by an authority other than you, because self-discipline is also willpower and is also what allows you to manifest the life that you want. But it won't always be riches because you might start to see it as an empty construct as you get healthier and happier and really determine what makes you happy. And what makes me happy is not designer clothes or jewelry or big houses. I like pretty views. I like to see butterflies. I like fields of flowers. I like rutting water. I like nature. It turns out a lot more. Now, I couldn't in Colorado because the sun practically murdered me. And I have to spend the summer inside in Southern California as well. But that creates like this, I'm looking forward to getting back to hiking outside of rattlesnake season as well. I get to look forward to things in a way that I didn't before. And it turns out I don't need a lot. And that I kind of like being able to do a lot of things that other people don't. I don't get a lot of convenience foods. I cook from like scratch as much as I humanly can. And I allowed myself to go back to being a vegetarian because I'm actually a really good cook and a good baker. And it allowed me to experiment because I actually make up my own cake recipes, which is something that like, it's a lot of fun. And sometimes it does not yield great results, but it's like being a little chemist in my own kitchen. And it's like playing. That is what I found in solitude was the ability to be a very playful person because I do whatever I want whenever I wish to do it. And that is not a form of narcissism. It allows me to replenish myself, to be happier, to be calmer, to be healthier whenever I wish to be. And it means that when I am working, when I am doing things like this, when I'm trying, because I'm doing this trying to help people. I don't make any money off this podcast, guys. I don't make any money off of it. But it does really give me a sense of value in this world that the people who listen are finding things that might help them feel happier and healthier. Because when I really examined my life about who I wish to be in it, what I valued, I have always wanted to try and help find a way to make the world a better place because we are not a lost cause. We are not a lost cause. Do you know the book, The Lord of the Flies, which I have solidly refused to read my entire life, but I'm familiar with the entire plot line because it gets brought up so much as some kind of indication of who we really are. It's who we might choose to be under extreme circumstances. A bunch of school kids, plane crash, they you know turn on each other, or they bully the living crap out of somebody that they give a wicked nickname to, and it's just a men suck type of thing. And there's a lot of that type of literature from usually the 1950s and things uh, because of the you know the facade of the American family that ignored all kinds of dysfunction and said behave this way and you will be this way instead of having all kinds of emotional dysfunction that then led to generational drama. But in reality, when I believe it was a men's soccer team, and I do not recall what country they are from, when their plane crashed, um, and they, were, they weren't they were school children, but they weren't much older than that, um, what actually happened was they formed a society where they helped each other and they took care of each other until they were rescued. Stop thinking that the worst that we can be is all that we can be. And that's another thing that your focus can give to you is the ability to have hope again. And you know what that does? Makes absolutely everything better. It has nothing to do with denial. It has to do with where are you focusing your mind's eye? Where are you focusing your attention? And where are you focusing your energy? Take it back and you will immediately have a better life because you will be the person who is in, who's the one trying to guide it instead of the exterior forces that are trying to plug into you like an outlet to drain your energy, usually to make money off of you. It is just one of the things that has happened in the modern day world. And 
do we judge it as good or bad? Who cares, man? It just is. And it's something that it's making a lot of people unhappy. So we need to find ways around it. And we need to find an ability to have peace. And that peace comes from within. It, it's, you can't go out and buy it. You can't go out and buy it. You cannot go out and buy serenity within and finding what you truly enjoy in life. And the things that I truly enjoy are there's now it that it has limits on that because like you know I've taken really nice cruises and I really enjoy them love to do that again someday as a treat <laughs> I would not want to live like that in fact the entire time I was on a five star I think it might be a six star show it's a really really nice uh, a cruise line called Regent Seven Seas um, the entire time I was there I talked to the staff because I liked them and the actual passengers were so they were they were very superficial in my eyes does that mean that they were in their particulars no they were just inhabiting a role and trying to don the costumes of what their role was supposed to convey to the world around them whereas i really liked the people who were working really hard because it let them travel the entire world and they would get time in each port i liked that i liked people who saw their obstacles and were willing to overcome them finding joy in the things that were available to them, including things like supporting their families in other countries where they would send the majority of their wages home. And it is that balance between self and selflessness that we're trying to find when we seek inner solitude to find our focus and find our power. So this has been Logical Magic about finding your focus and finding your power um, and looking to it first in your ability to disconnect, to disconnect because that is about releasing your attachments and everything that you have been attached to in your life is the result of basically societal programming, what you were taught to value, what you were taught to believe about yourself and others, and what you were taught to believe about the worth of your individual divine soul within this lifetime, your society, your country, your political party, the school that you went to, none of these places can convey your worth that is always putting your worth in an exterior judgment rather than an interior knowledge. And that's what, when you seek that, what you find is guidance and peace and the ability to remedy your own ills in your emotional world, learning how to respect your feelings and to not take crap from other people and to respect your needs as well. Because that's what I'm talking about, turning my phone on, do not disturb. What I do is draining. And I just, I can't let my clients have access to me in my downtime. And so I don't. And it's not because I don't care about them. It's because I really want to be able to do a good job when we're face to face and when I'm doing things like this as well. So it's been Logical Magic Examining Esoteric. If you need to find me, you can find me at, at therisingmoon.com exclusively. You can find me at Chromecast at The Rising Moon on YouTube. Video versions of this are here. And then uh, I have a Patreon, um, which is actually very low cost. It's $5 a month, and it has spirit guide messages. I'm teaching tarot in reverse every now and then. I get a special message, and it's expanding into other things as well. I hope you're able to join us. Take care and be well.